some of you will say, well, Brother Wood, I really don't believe that. I've, God's my witness tonight. I've tried to get out of this all day. But this is what the Lord wants. And back in 1946, when the war was over, there was a meeting for a bunch of men and John McKay, who was the president or head man at Princeton University, was a liberal, a liberal theologian, and he uh, brought it up that, uh, that they needed to get one man, and that one man was to evangelize America. And then right after they uh, made that motion, they called Dr. Bob Jones out of preach, senior, the old man who's dead now, and he got up and preached, and uh, they, these people had a plan, and the plan was the war is over, and we want to fill these uh, churches. Uh, they call them churches, the uh, Methodists and Baptists and uh, Episcopalians and what have you. They said, we want to fill these churches, and uh, we want to get uh, one man, and use one man, and all the churches go together and fill our churches. And Dr. Bob Jones got up, Bob Jones Sr., in 1946, and said, if you do that, you'll kill the churches. You'll kill evangelism. Evangelism is for the local churches. And so the old man, he he done his job and done it well, and they voted that down. But there was a plan, and I call it the plan of conspiracy, and that conspiracy was to put in the hands of one man the job of evangelizing America. Now, the purpose of this conspiracy was to fill the churches. Fill the churches. And uh, that's never, that's never been God's plan. God is to, to get people saved. And again. And that was the purpose. And the power that they were to use was money, the media, the masses, and the ministry. Now, I want you to get that. They had to have the money. They got that rich men. Media, they got that. Religion has use of all media. Then they had the masters in the ministry. Now, the principle that was laid out was this. When the, uh, every time an old outlaw, dope fiend, or gangster gets saved, then we'll get him up immediately and give a testimony because people come to hear him, they won't come to hear a preacher. And so they begin to use those men. That's the first time that that was ever used. Uh, old uh, whores like uh, Jane Russell and, and uh, guys like girls like that, they were asked to come to the platform, get up in the pulpit, and give their testimony. Now, when do you ever believe that a man of God would let a dirty legged prostitute like that get in the pool pit. Amen? Amen. And so this was the principle that was laid out. And so they said, uh, let's forget doctrine, advocate love, and do away with words like repentance, born again, and hell. And so they did. Now, the paralyzing effect of this thing, it was carried out in 1949, afforded in, and they began to look for that man, that man that they would use. And uh, the, this conspiracy was carried completely through until our day. It corrupted our schools. It corrupted our Bibles. It corrupted the man of God. It corrupted our nation and got outside and corrupted the world. That's a great conspiracy. And I'm telling you, this conspiracy was started in 1946 in, a, in the World Council of Churches and carried out, and buddy, they've done a good job. I want to commend them. They've done a good job. I was a member of the Southern Baptist, and I and uh, I remember Dr. Otis Strickland, that great man there in Texas. He got up and said, "We'll have no part of this, no part of this." And but uh, uh, he, they never heard his voice. He was fired from the school, and and uh, it was carried out in our state. And uh, so they began to look for that evangelist. Well, 1937, Dr. Dr. Monroe was holding a little meeting down here in Charlotte, and uh, and a young man named Billy Graham. He was staying in, the, in his father's home, Frank Graham, and Billy Graham made a profession of faith in his meeting. Said he got saved. Well, he sent him off to Bob Jones, and uh, a bunch of things transpired. But uh, a few years later, he heard him give his testimony. He said he got saved under Mordecai Hand. And so he asked him, he said, uh, uh, Billy, I don't want to, Dr. Monroe Parker, if he's here tonight, I'd tell it. I knew James Parker was a friend of mine, pastor right there by me, who's his brother. I knew him. He was a Southern Baptist man. But uh, Dr. P those Parker boys, it was all good men. 
But uh, he said, Billy, there's some uh, bit of misunderstanding. He said, you know, you come forward, except in Christ, uh, was baptized in the meeting when I was there. And I told a lot of people that you were saved in my meeting. And I just had to know, well, you saved. He said, well, I had made a profession in Mordecai Ham's meeting in Charlotte. And uh, he said, and then after that, I got to drinking and everything and running around for about a year. And then you come to town and preach, and I made another profession, and I made another profession. So, and uh, really, it doesn't make you know why I was saved. The thing is, I've been saved. And he said, well, you know, I just want to get it clear. Well, uh, Brother Jack Woods don't believe you ever got saved. I don't believe man's ever saved. I believe that history has taught me that, that he's not saved. So you say, well, I differ with you. Okay, that's your opinion. I just gave you mine. So you've got your opinion. You've got a right to that, don't you? We're Americans. Some of us fought in the war on it. And so you can have your opinion. I have mine. But I would like you to hear the facts that I base my opinion on. And then if you want to write down some uh, uh, facts uh, and say, well, brother, well, this is why I believe what I believe, then you write them down and I'll read them and, uh, and we won't be any argument about them. So uh, the first thing I'd like you to look at is your Bible, right? In John 17 and uh, chapter 4, if you have your Bible. Uh, uh, 17 verse 14. Excuse me. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Now, I know you're here with me in John 17, 14. I'm sorry tonight. I make no apology. I've done what God told me to do. I've never preached this message before, but I'm fixing to preach it now. I've taught it to my church in Sunday school. I, 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 this is Sunday school material for us. And if you can't chew it, well, maybe you ought to go to Sunday school. Amen? I give it to my people in Sunday school. Amen? But I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them. How come you done made up your mind and you ain't never heard me yet? How come you made up your mind and you haven't heard me yet? I have given them thy word, the world has hated them. Because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus said, I give them the word, the world hates them. Now, I would like to say the first thing, the reason, my reasoning, and it's my reasoning, it's my reasoning, and I'm telling you tonight, not a theological thing, I'm giving you my reason. And Jack Wood's reason says that Billy Graham is accepted by the world. If you're not saved here tonight, if you're not saved, you're mad already. And uh, if, uh, if somebody would come up and say, uh, come to your house tomorrow, and say, where was you at? Well, I found old Carl like this church. Well, I don't even think he's a Christian old heathen. And you say, well, I don't know if he's not. But tonight, I tell you, Billy Graham's going to say, you're mad. How come your ears already red? Isn't that strange? Your ears already got red. But now, he is accepted by the world. Now, you prove that, Brother Wood. Well, he has all of the... He can preach on any radio and any television in America. You and I can't. And yet, he's carried by the media. The media accepts him, condones him, and congratulates him for everything he says. And that's right. They didn't do nothing to us that way. Huh? Amen? Amen. All right. All right. So it's accepted by the world. The newspapers, they write everything he says. And the newspaper in the world write everything they find bad about Carl Lecce. Houston says everything bad they can say about Jack Wood. I can send you some news clippings on me that you would probably leave. And thank you. All right. But the news media, the world, loves Dr. Graham. The newspaper loved Dr. Graham. The, what would we call them, politicians? They want his approval. Amen? And uh, they, he's got theirs. Now, you listen to me. The religionist, the, you go any modernistic church here in town that don't believe nothing, and you walk in and say, what do you think about Dr. Graham? I believe that he's one of the most wonderful Christians that there are. What do you think about Carl Lackey? They say, yeah. Yeah. Amen? You might want to be fair with me. Hear me out. Hear me out. I've got my ideas about this thing. He's invited to Washington. Amen? He's invited to all of the large conferences of the world. He's invited to violent countries. I mean, the communist calling friend. Everybody in the world of life, he's their friend. Yes. Yes. The Bible says the world speaks good of you. 
Amen. He said, I've given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Now, look at verse 16. They're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Then why does the world love this man? Now, I believe, I've always believed, for 25 years I've taught it. You took it over in your mind two or three times. I believe that the devil in every country of the world has in a seat. And the Bible says that that where Satan's seat is. And Satan sets up in a stronghold to ruin that nation. I believe in all my heart that the devil owns the country of Paris, France. I believe Paris is a place where he draws up the thousands of women to dress. In the, state, in the city of Rome. He owns Rome. That's where she is. And that's where he designs all of his rotten religion. But I'm going to tell you one thing. That many years ago, God showed me that the devil owns Los Angeles, California. And he's used that one city of more than any other city in the world to corrupt the whole world. He's used the movies and the, the Marilyn Monroe's, and he has rotted our nation to the core. And in 1951, this young evangelist goes there and had a three-week meeting, and nothing happened until an old drunk walked down the aisle, and they said, we're going to have, the, we're going to have this uh, Stuart Hamlin to come and sing. And when Stuart Hamlin saw him that night, and the tent was filled because of Stuart Hamlin, not because of Billy Graham. Don't need no amen. You want me to say amen to me? I already believe this anyway. He's accepted by the world. Jesus said, any man, if any man is a friend of the world, he's an enemy of God. I believe I'll just say what Jesus said. A few years ago, over there in Japan, they said, uh, Dr. Graham, what do you think about the Shinto religion? He said, I believe the sin of religion on national television in Japan. He said, I believe that us Christians have a lot to learn from the Shindus. What do you think about the Hindus? Same thing, same story. What did Jesus said? He had said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So he's, a, he's accepted by the world. And he has the approval of all wicked religion. And you write that down. You write that down in front of your Bible. And all religion says, did you hear what they did at that King James Jubilee? A man got up and said that Billy Graham was not a Christian. And on the same news, they cussed over this church, they cussed the pastor, and they said, what do you think about that? And they said, well, that's probably so. But I want to tell you something tonight. Graham, Dr. Billy Graham has the approval of every rotten religion in the world today. The other day he started to, started over to Russia, and he's going to Russia over there. As he was going through there, he stopped by Rome. He stopped by Rome, and he asked the Pope. He said, "My dear Christian brother, what do you think you ought to do?" I'm going to tell you something now. You think it might be funny, but I've got a picture when two Catholic priests hung the yoke of Rome upon him, and he said, "This is one of Leroy. You've seen it." He said, "This is the most wonderful hour." In my life, as he put that black yoke upon his neck, he's yoked up with Rome. And he has the approval of all religion. Every modernist Methodist thinks he's the greatest man in the world. Every modernist Presbyterian thinks he's the greatest thing in the world. And some of you fundamental Baptists do too. This, this, thing, this thing used to not even be an issue, but it's loads of gin. And just what we came out of 25 years ago, we're headed straight back to what we come out of. Yes, sir. Us fundamental Bible-believing Baptists are listening to some men that are leading us astray, and they're not fundamentalists. They do not believe this Bible is the Word of God. And I'm just here to tell you, most of them don't even what salvation is. I'll get through here in a minute. Don't you jump out. Dr. Schaffen in my city is the coordinator of the Billy Graham Crusade. He's the coordinator. 
He had a front page. He's a Southern Baptist pastor in our city, the biggest church there. He had a front page, and he said, Is there a devil? He said, There is no such thing as a person of the devil. There is no such a being as the devil. The devil is an influence. How could you be an influence if you wasn't nobody? Dr. Billy Graham, Buddha, Rome, Mohammedanism, whatever you say, has no controversy with Dr. Graham. Thank you, Brother Wood. He bears the yoke. Now, the next thing I want you to know, he is opposed by ever old warrior of the cross. Old Dr. Bob Jones, if you call him back from the grave tonight, I can see him right now. In 1958 or 9, we had him in a meeting, and he put his hand to his mouth and said, Boys, come out! Come out! That rotten thing. Some men came out, and some men stayed in. Like Dr. Paul Carr and like Evangelist Freddie Gage and the little old uh, Saturday nighty thing, they all stayed in. They had two tone shoes, two tone wire, two tone cars, and two tone messages to fit any place they went. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ed. And he is, he is opposed by every uh, John L. Rice and uh, E. Y. Bynum and read the writing the Spartan. Every man of God stood against it. Why, John Bunyan was put in a prison for what this man has done. This man refused to be approved by the religious art of his day. He was put in prison, laid down 14 years, and I'm saying the man that this type of minister is a condemnation to those that have lived godly in Christ Jesus. Our forefathers who were Baptists that believed the word of God, they gave us lies to what we're doing here tonight. And I tell you one thing, I refuse. To let a man who don't even go to church tell me how to live for God. Remember the first Baptist church in Dallas, Texas? You called Dr. Crystal tonight and asked him when's the last time he attended. That was about five years ago. And if you ain't attended church in about five years, I don't think you're much of a Christian. Why did you say, Brother Wood? He's very busy. Okay, we'll just take Brother Jim Wright, for instance. But Jim, you're a very busy man. And so your wife goes down and joins them out of this Presbyterian church. She takes her children out and lets them dance. And uh, Jim, you just don't have time to go to church. So you're holding three big campaigns a year. A week at a time. I mean, that's three weeks out of the year. And the rest of 49 weeks, you've got to rest, man, because you're busy. You're busy. And now who in the world would call Jim White for a the meeting? Now, some of you are mad, but you'll get mad for us all over it. And you'll go outside and you'll argue and argue, but you don't know nothing. You're just done, that's all. You have never read nothing. You ain't never stood out. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you that a conspiracy was formed in the heart of John McCarr and then that Dr. Ockenkay. And those men picked this man out and said this little fanatic can be groomed and took him in a back closet and said, put that word away. That word saved. Born again with purpose and hell out of your imputation. And just say, come down and make a decision and a commitment. And a man who used to say, come and get saved, said, come now and make your decision. And that big, that big smart John Simpleton, who was a liberal, he said, y'all just leave this fanatic alone. When I get through grooming him, when I get through grooming him, the church will glean from all the work that he's doing. The church. That bunch of Wiscopalians, a bunch of lost Methodists, ain't none of the church. They're a member of that heart. And they're all going back to Rome. And I've been teaching 25 years that there's a little man named Graham that's leading them home. And we're all headed back to that city on some hills. You say, I don't believe that. You don't believe nothing. That's all right. I don't, I don't bother me a bit in the world. I'm doing me a bit in the world. And Carl Lacks is going to preach, I'm going to preach. He's opposed by the old warrior of the cross. And he's a man of great wealth. Owns that, uh, I believe it's called a Rapco, a Rapco jewelry. Owns it last year. It was worth $17 million. You said, brother, well, that's, uh, he put $22 million in this state right here in land. He goes, well, you say, how do you know that? I'm not giving you no second-hand information. I don't put out second-hand information. I either preach the Bible or some facts that I have at hand. I said he owned $22 million worth of this land right here in this state. He's a rich man. Follow the man who never had a place to lay his head. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Now you say, oh, Carl, that has got a Cadillac. Yeah, and your little pet preacher has got millions stashed away in the bank, you idiot. And you send him some more to put in there. But see, he got that from his mom. He was raised to Southern Baptist in a in Virginia. He found out that they had millions uh, in the mission fund. Back then when I pulled out in 60, they had some 17 million in the mission fund. And he said, if they can have a fund, I can have a fund. And so everybody now has got a fund. Guys like old Bobby Trundle, taking a $20 off and a $50 off and going on down the road doing work for God. And you say you don't have any right. Uh, Brother Woods, you don't have right. Okay, we're going to just use Jim. We're going to say Jim's a young preacher and Brother Woods an old preacher. And you do Jim, you say, now, Brother Woods, you don't have any right to criticize that man. He's won more souls than you have. Well, I've won more than you have. You don't have right to criticize me. <laughs> yes, sir. Your mule won't work. Your mule won't work. Amen. So he, he's a man of great wealth. We, I mean, he has prosperity, he has property, he has popularity, he has millions in the jewel business. Yes, that's his business. No, I'm making it my business. Right here tonight. And thank you. Now, I want you to write down the fifth thing. He's never had a severe whipping from God. I believe I'm in a fundamentalist camp tonight. I believe that we're in a King James Jubilee. Go to Wild Hog. You've been preaching for many years. What if you would go down there tonight and go to the First Methodist Church and say, now, First Methodist Church and First Presbyterian Church, now, y'all don't believe anything, but let's just get together and from now on, let's just have a united service and, and us three is going to go together. Uh, what would be the next thing that you would be looking for God to do to Brother Wise Heart? Dust his riches. Knock him in the head. Yeah. Drive him off. And burn him somewhere. No man is going to take God's people astray without getting a severe whipping from God. I, 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 I feel all the resistance. Don't bother me a bit in the world. I preach in jails and prisons where people are just like you. Don't believe nothing. They get up and thank God when they're in jail. They can't walk out because they're in hell locked up. Amen. But he never had a severe whipping from God. He's never preached against sin. He's never preached against the modern dance. He's never preached against alcohol. Hey, he said, my Savior, drink it. That's right. I cut it out, placed it in my Bible. If you walk up here tonight, my old godly daddy's been the preacher of all these years. He said, I saw your daddy, Brother Wood, he's drinking some wine. I hit you right between the eyeballs. Billy Graham has no right to talk about my Lord. He saved old Jack Wood from a life of sin. He don't have that right. And I'm saying tonight that this man has never had a whipping for God. He's never preached against sin. He's never, never, never denounced rotten religion. You stand to your feet tonight and tell me that you heard him preach against the sins of the Methodists, or the sins of the Presbyterians, or the sins of the Baptists. You say, well, Brother Wood, what he does, he just preaches the Word. You moron, you... The Bible said, preach that whole counsel of God. Timothy, preach the word and be instant in season, out of season, rebuke with all of them suffering. A man who's an evangelist and God is to stand and denounce sin. That brother, which you don't understand. The reason he don't is where he can get them all here. I know why he don't, honey. You don't have to tell me. See, I've laid awake at night and worried over this thing. I've laid awake at night. Old man Boyle Gary here was just a, just a year ago. He stood in the Catholic Church and preached to 2,200 people. And he said, this is the hour that I've lived for. It's to see Baptist and the Catholic and all these wonderful Christians meet here together. And I know a man and woman that was locked in a prison just about a mile from there for 14 years because they'd handed out gospel tracts. I tell you what you do, let's walk over tonight and knock on the sail. Hey, brother, if you and your wife, hey, I'd like to get a testimony from you. Brother, you, you've been here in the prison. You heard about the big meeting downtown? And he had laughed and he said, It ain't our kind, Brother Wood. I said, Oh, that was a, a great evangelistic meeting. He said, Brother Wood, everyone of them is KGB men. 
their police brotherhood. There is not God's men. God's men are on the ground, brotherhood. God's men, brotherhood, hide not in the woods. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I wish I had another message. Now, you'd probably, you could have probably shouted, but that's not what you really need. He speaks well of all religion. All religion. Mr. Peel, would you come, please, and lead us in prayer? And old Norman Vincent Peel and two or three more that needs to be Peel, they walk up there and say, Our dear Heavenly Father, Norman Vincent Peel is a total liberal. Total liberal. I could stop out here and punch it once, but I won't. I'll pass on. He's a total liberal. One of your men not far from here had a wedding in his church with him and helped him marry one of his members on here. But I won't deal with Jerry now. I'm talking about Billy. Amen. He's influenced. He's, he's, he's a man of, of whipping. Amen. He never, never had a severe whipping from God. Amen, brother. I don't care. I mean, he gives, he gives money to every ungodly cause that Jesus breaks. My God. You know that, Dr. Lee, everything's all right. I want to say tonight that his influence is quickly withering away. Now, thank God. 1954 or 5, my mother took me out, some say, about 54, I guess, 53. My mother took me out there to and preach. 75,000 people in a big stadium, all Baptists. Just a few months ago, just a few months ago in Houston, Texas, with every Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic, Jehovah, everybody you could imagine, I mean every kind, creed, color, whatever, and there they had 20,000 people. And so the people walked down the aisle, and when they walked down the aisle, they said, well, what are you? I'm a Catholic, I come, I want to be born. And yes, sir, and Father, so-and-so will deal with you. And, uh, and just sort of looked like Zorro, had one in Frankenstein colors on, you know. Everybody called him Father. He knelt down and blessed them and blessed them and blessed them. And they wrote him down and said, we had another convert. Uh-huh. You poor idiot. You. you can't take it, can you? You're a hell fine brimstone preacher. You little sissy, you. You little sissy, you. You say, Brother Lord, I just believe that anybody that just died and calls on the Lord, he's saved. You've got to be, you've got to be, oh, you need to be over here in a, in a hospital somewhere. You need to have a straight jacket. There's something wrong with you. Listen, here's in French. There used to be 60,000. Now, there's only 20,000. Used to be meetings constantly, all the time. Now it's down to three meetings a year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank God he's right. He's deceived. Many weak believers. Some of you weak as banks water the night. And you said, boy, Brother Wood, look at the crowd that's following. Look at the crowd that's following Stallback. Look at the crowd that's following the Cowboys. Huh? Look at the crowd that's following Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. Look at the crowd that's following Khrushchev. Just because a crowd, that don't mean a Christ. A crowd does not mean a Christ. And I want to say there's been many, a little weak believer. I mean, a young preacher have found this man into an ecumenical faith. When in the world did a Baptist who loved God and live a separated life, how could he have a meeting with a Presbyterian who don't even know Jesus Christ, taught in the seminary that lies a virgin birth, and those men come together, get on the platform, crowd in the leading prayer. My soul. This thing, and, we, and you know, we come out of this thing, and we, you know, we quit preaching about this thing. We just forgot this for years. And all of a sudden, we dressed it up in another color. We headed right back, boys. Listen, old Dr. J. Frank Norris, that great man of God, and here just the other day, a group of them, they had a Catholic woman, they had the Independent Baptist, they had the Southern Baptist, and two men from the World Baptist went over and preached. And now that woman, she, who don't even believe, nothing about the Bible, she's a woman Catholic. And thank God for this. Curtis Hudson wrote him a letter. He was booked to be on the meeting. He said, I'm just sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I just can't come. I cannot preach. I thank God for Curtis and his stand. And he said, I will not come and preach with that lady. And in the Houston paper, uh, James Robinson put it. I've known him. I knew his uh, man who raised him, his stepdad who raised him. I knew not his stepdad, but an old preacher raised the boy. Old Brother Hale raised my there second Baptist church in Pasadena. And he put in the paper, he said, this, uh, these uh, red-faced fundamentalists, 
wouldn't be in my meeting. That's me. That's me. I, I mean, there are me with a big B and a big L. I'm a Baptist fundamentalist. And I ain't going to be in his meeting with a Roman Catholic woman up there preaching. Because women ain't supposed to be preaching no more. And this wasn't in a, this wasn't in a mild majority group. This was in a Bible conference. I believe this thing needs to be dealt with here tonight, Carl. And that, I wish those Sam Woods would come down that dynamite I was telling you about. I believe we need to blow a stump or two here. <laughs> but he deceived, deceived many. And then young, uh, young believers were led into godless churches. You said, but would you believe some of those people got saved? How many of y'all were saved in the Billy Graham Crusade? Raise your hand. There's one right there. God bless you. Amen. There's one man got saved there. You're the second one I've ever met. And it's good to meet you. Yes, sir. I've never met a man. I've never met a man. I've only been on the road 29 years. I've never met a man called a priest in a Billy Graham crusade. I saw some in the car like it. Saw that three or four in the Jack Woods. A few under this man and that man. A few under Peter Redmond. But that's a funny thing. I've never found nobody under this man. But I want to say this now and go right over the message. Uh, he not only does that, he's corrupted schools of theology. You said, give me the incident, Brother Wood. Dr. Bear, Dr. Um, give me his name, John. When Dr. In, in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Pastor First Baptist Church. Well, Dr. Riley, there you go. Dr. W.B. Riley, he died. They give Billy Graham that school. They give him that school, and that school went down the tube. And Dr. Riley took it out of the convention in five years' time he was back in the convention. The Northern Baptist Convention that denies the virgin birth of Christ. You know, I believe tonight we're sitting in fundamentalist camp, and I believe we're just fixing a slide past. And I believe every one of them are going back to Rome. Because when you mention the leaders that are leading us to Rome, it makes Baptists mad. They don't like it. They say, you just leave us alone. And bless God, if we want to worship God with the Pope, that's our business. You go ahead and worship God with the Pope, honey, but I'm going to be in the rapture, and you and the Pope can have yourself a time. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And he condones. He condones. He condones. And these weak believers, and these schools of theology went down the drain. And he, when I, I was at Tennessee Temple in 1954, I guess it was, or 55, I was at school. So I was able to say was in town. Oh, they're lovely Christian men. They, they say we're red-faced, we're ugly, we're cantankers, we're mean. And uh, we called him and asked him if he'd come and sing in the chapel. He said, what's the name of the school? Tennessee Temple. Well, no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. But you know where he was singing the next day? Over to Presbyterian School. But you know what we are? We're ugly. And we're mean. And we're hateful. And we're really just, it's in for the bad, we're just really ungodly. Because, see, you're not supposed to say anything mean about anybody. In other words, you ought to just say the devil's a pretty nice guy, you know. At least he stays busy, you know. That's why. That's why. But I want to say this. I want to say He condones wickedness. Is Billy Graham saved? Brother Wood says, no, you can say what you want to. If I see him in heaven, I'll be the most surprised person in the world. And if Norman Vincent Field and Mr. Fostick and Mr. Niebuhr is there with him, I'm going to leave that pick. I know I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> this thing might not even be as serious to you. It might not even be as serious to you. But I'm here to tell you tonight that every man that's sitting in this building tonight, or every woman who lost a brother, who lost a part of your family in World War II, Niebuhr, Fostick, and a bunch of modernists are responsible for every drop of blood on the foreign field. In 1934 and 1935, uh, Douglas MacArthur told them, said the Japanese were coming in to invade these islands, and uh, Niebuhr and Fostick and all the modernists said, stood right there in Washington, told Mr. Roosevelt, and said, listen, we don't need to buy guns. Because we're pacifists. And a pacifist and a modernist and a communist all cut out the same piece of cloth. So they said, every man died on Wake Island, you take his blood and lay it at the door. And when that war was over in this meeting, I'll tell you about 1947, Dr. Carroll, who was a, a leading modernist, 
He said, I stand before this ecumenical movement here today in 1949. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was there. I heard him. Dr. Bob Jones said, Dr. Carroll said, the blood of every man that died in this great war is dripping from the hands of us martyrs. And we shall return back to our orthodoxy that we've left many years ago. Shall we go all the way? No! 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 What we shall do is find us a new modernism. And I'm here to tell you today, they found it. It's called neo-evangelicalism. Yes, sir. A modernist is the enemy of your church. He's the enemy of your country. And World War II proved that. They stood in the streets, faster to Niebuhr. They stood in those streets. They were ahead of Union Theological Seminary, and it's the most communistic, wicked, godless fool the world has ever known. Everybody knows that. Dr. Graham went there and said, I want to tell you today, the gospel that I preach has got a loaf of bread in one hand and a gospel in another. I tell you, the gospel that I preach is the blood in God's hand to save you and nothing else. I have no social gospel for a lost and dying world. Thank you, Brother Wood. But he condones wickedness. Come back down the other day. Second Baptist Church had one of his preachers and uh, invited the whole town to come in over Second Baptist Church and hear this dear lady preach. She's now on the Billy Graham. Her name is McClay. A wonderful preacher from the state of North Carolina. <laughs> First, volunteers, will you? Okay, thank you. I won't say that. Yeah. At least a bunch of stupid idiots out there in Texas let her do it. He condemns women preachers, modernists, the movie stars. Oh, he's a fundamental, sure. Godless men like Peel, versions of every different word of God there is. Don't get mad at me. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do that. I didn't let that woman preach in the pulpit. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say Jesus got drunk. I mean, don't you know? Don't get mad at me. How come you're so mad? Some of you hell fire and brimstone preachers. God bless you. Ain't you sad? Ain't you? Don't you wish you somewhere else tonight? Don't you wish you said, "Well, I do." Well, I tell you what we'll do. We'll take one. We'll have a, a five minute, a five second interval, and we'll bow our heads. But you sissy, you sneak out. Amen. That's right. He condones wickedness. He's an enemy of every true worshiper. Jack Wilson, 1953, invited Billy Graham to New York to hold a Bible meeting. And he said, y'all get together. I said, I've been invited by the, by the other group, which were a bunch of modernists from the Union Theological Seminary. And so he came down and met with him, and Jack Wilson said, okay. He said, well, uh, he argued with him, said, let's have a doctrinal stand. He said, I have no doctrinal stand. And I am of the persuasion, Brother Jones, that the church, when she leaves here, her apparel is not going to be holiness. Her apparel, her clothing is going to be doctrine. The church has always been identified by doctrine. The church has always been clothed in Bible doctrine. And there's a little thing going on today, and you hear it too, don't you? With these new evangelicals, said it don't make any difference what you believe. You know, just put your doctrine aside. Well, I mean, you know, doctrine aside, that should put your teaching aside. Put the word of God aside. How can you put the word of God aside? And, we, and so these men here are enemies of the true worshiper. They call us red faced fundamentalists. I guess we are. I, I say men to that. I try. I say men to, but they call us what they please. But if we say anything about it, they said, you know, Brother Wood don't have any love. And, I, and you know, the issue today is meeting us men who believe the King James Bible. They said, why don't we just forget these issues and go on about soul winning? Brother Paul, how many? You say y'all had saved here the last month. About how many more or less? About 50. Brother Carl, what you need to do is quit these issues and go to soul winning. I'm going to ask you a question. Well, Dr. Brown had that great meeting in New York. I wonder how many souls has been saved in the first Methodist church since he had that meeting. 
How many souls do you think was saved in St. Teresa's Catholic Church since he left Houston? How many souls do you think was saved in uh, this uh, Reagan's good buddy up there? What's his name? Bush? Is that, is that the guy's name? No, his name is. Is that, is that the guy's crazy? What's his name? Bush? No, he's my friend Texas. He's Bush. He's Bush, all right. He's half the subject of the day. He was there at Billy Graham Crusade. He said that they said, I want you to know, everybody knows, that Mr. Bush and me have never been born again. They put it in the Houston paper where everybody can read on the religious side and said we are well pleased with our first birth and our family were of good heritage and we are fine people and we're satisfied with our first birth. We don't need a new birth. When Mr. Bush gets to hell, he'll wish he had something. And I'm going to say one thing, he's going to look over that fire and trust Billy Graham while he's doing it. Or I think. <laughs> oh, Lord. You know, an old, old drunkard. Yes, he's all bush on. But an old drunkard walks down the aisle here. Old drunkard comes down the aisle, makes a professional faith, and you see him about three weeks later, and he's drunk. And he's just a drunkard and a drunkard. Well, according you, kind of get the idea that maybe, maybe he didn't get saved. That's my right thing. Well, you know, if a man who went into a naughty religion, false as it can be, led everybody astray and stayed there 25 years, wouldn't you kind of get the idea that maybe, maybe, like you told Dr. Parker, I thought I got saved under more than I am, I thought I got saved under you, and I thought I got saved. It really makes you where you got saved. But I was out in West Texas preaching here a while back, and, and I asked the man, I said, where'd you get saved? He said, walked outside, and he walked right back to the second seat, and he said, I sat right there. He said, 49 years ago, I sat right there, and he said, down on my knees, I called on God, and he said, God came and met with me there. He said, I'm just an old country boy, very good cowboy, and I'm trying to preach across these hills, but I know where I got saved. This man don't know where he got saved, and I don't know where he got saved. And he had not lived like he was saved. And he don't talk like a saved man. What's that now? Now, he's an uh, enemy of them two worship, worshipers are uncooperated. Now, I have a... Don Green was sitting with us yesterday. Don and I have just become close friends and call each other every week on the phone. I call Billy Carl and... Us three, maybe our personalities are like or something, I don't know. But uh, anyway, we was all sitting there yesterday, and you was there. And Don jumped up from the table, and we was eating, and his boy was sitting about, what, eight or ten of us there? And he got up and raised his hand, and the glory to God. And he ran around the cafe, and he said, glory to God. Tears started running down his face. That old mean preacher, y'all think he's mean. Tears running down his face. He said, glory to God. He said, eight years ago, I made a decision to leave the group I with because of the Bible. And God let me sit down here today with God's men. And my boy is the greatest of the influence of God's men. He said, I just want to praise God for the decision I'm Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm glad. I'm glad, Dave. That's my boy sitting over there. I'm glad, Dave. I'm glad. We didn't have nothing. We lived in a little shack, Dave. We didn't have nothing. We cleaned the septic tank out with a bucket. I mean, just clean down. Just real poor. I mean, just run a boy rolling right through the side of the house. Never knock a hair off of I mean, just poor. Very poor. Let me find this life at me. Freddie Gage, he said, Jack, you're going to wind up with one black suit teaching the Bible for Brother Willow. They laughed. But you know now they're talking about what they used to be. What they used to be. And ain't there been nothing. They're just a, you know, that, that sensationalism is gone. You can read that book, Pulpit in the Shadows. You Uh, we're uncomfortable. We're unchristlike. We're peddlers of hate. They said it wrecked face for minutes. That don't sound like a very good Christian word to use on a man. How about that? Yeah. yeah that's right. Why don't you say them bare dirty, wicked, ungodly modernists? Why don't you say them nasty, dirty, stuffy communists? Why do you pour your hate out on the church of God? In disguise, we love everybody. May the Lord bless you. 
Dr. Billy Graham does not recognize the work of God. That's right. You for Christ is not the work of God. That's right. The work of God is a local, independent church. That's the work of God. And the church has no say but he does. The modernist says what he does. And I'm telling you tonight that the fundamentalists are headed that way in the ecumenicalists. We're headed that way. We're headed that, we're headed that way. Listen, he gives his money to the youth for Christ. Last year, he said, I gave $250,000 to the youth for Christ. You ought to see him witnessing. They got their hair all down over their ears. They got a pair of tight fitting butchers on. The little girl's got a pair of Bermuda shorts on. And she said, God, teaching the Bible. She said, wouldn't you like to be saved? God bless you. They go over in them foreign countries. I got a, a, a letter from that team, mission board, team, mission board. I got it. And, and three ladies was over there winning this girl to Christ. One had a pair of Bermuda shorts on. Other had a pair of tight fitting bitches on. And they're just leading people to Jesus. And Lord, I'm here for that. Hallelujah. In this good car? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're in the King James Jubilee. Yeah, yeah, and some of y'all ain't having the Jubilee, are you? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I'd like to, I'd like tonight to call Dr. Bob Jones Jr. and say, Bob Jones Jr., how much money has Billy Graham donated to y'all? I hear him say, it's just a practical joke. <laughs> Hang up. <laughs> I'd like to call Dr. Lee Robinson tonight and say, Dr. Robinson, how much money has he donated? Any of you little independent Baptist churches struggling, trying to get by? They ever helped you? No. They helped you for Christ. You know why? Because in Houston, Texas, the other day, they sat down in a room and they said, lock the doors. And they locked the doors and a bunch of rich men, and it's in the Houston paper on the headlines, and they took up seven million dollars that night for you for Christ and it was a church after cash. Anything to help the youth, youth for Christ. Most wicked, ungodly, unchurched organization there is. Thank you, Brother Lord. They do not recognize the church of God. They come to Houston. Nobody has ever come and said, Brother Wood, would you even like to participate in our campaign? Why do they call me a red fundamentalist? They ain't never even heard me. But I want to say, I want to thank God for the Presbyterian. They got more conviction y'all have. I see that now. Some of y'all ain't got none. But there's that there's other day, and he walked up and said, Dr. Graham is a friend, is a friend, a real friend, he said, a real friend. And on the back of it said to the communists. Yeah. Yeah. The Presbyterian for that thing said he's a real friend, real friend. And while he was having a service the other day over in Russia, a lady got up and said, we've got 250 in Siberia. And they drug her out for ship her to Siberia. And he got up and he said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, if you violate the law in America, they'll put you in jail. Yeah. He's a scum. Yeah, but a fluid guy. Yeah. <laughs> I told my boy the other day, he said, we, he said, you want me to shoot that skunk here? I said, mm mm. <laughs> Leave us stuff alone. Well, you come to shout it out, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get right with God, you will shout it out. Amen. Amen. He does not recognize the local church. He does not attend the local church. I want to ask you a question. How big a shot do you have to be to you get immune to the local church? Call this pastor tonight. Dr. Christmas. Stand on his pulpit, Dr. Crystal, and tell us the last time he's been to church. Oh, Brother Wood, he's so busy. Busy doing what? For oh, three meetings a year, what's he busy doing? He's going to hell for what he's done. John, you've been married to Carol for many years. You've been an old soldier, you've been that Navy. I put his hand on that woman. Oh, you hurt me. Hey. That's right. You've been married to that woman. She's carried, been to those hell jails and what have you. Been. What about the Lord Jesus and his little church? And this bunch of wicked devils. Get up this bunch of martyrs. And stand up and say, Pass the church. Norman Vincent Peel. Fast. McCracken. 
in that crowd. My soul, what were we at? 1951, in Los Angeles, California, Dr. Brown got up and preached on the stage. I closed now. You've had enough. He got up and preached, and he said, I want to preach to you on a second coming in Christ. And I want to tell you that one of the greatest theologians of our time said, Dr. W.B. Riley, the next great event on the history pages is the second coming of Christ. Fifteen years later, preached the same sermon. Preached the same message, word for word. But he took Dr. W.B. Riley's name out there and put Dr. Boltzmann. Dr. Boltzmann is a modernist of the most tourist type. He said, Dr. Boltzmann said, the next event on the page of history is the second coming of Christ. W.B. Riley meant that the Lord was coming to the church of God. Dr. Bussman meant that the church was going to engulf the world and socialize her and make her a better place to live. They meant two different things. They meant two different things. But you've been duped and listened and listened and said, Well, Brother Wood, he preaches the gospel. I heard him say this with my own two ears. He said, If you don't know you're a sinner, and you don't understand you're a sinner, the Bible says you're a sinner. Just believe that you're a sinner and come to Christ and make your decision. And when you do, you'll go to hell and cuss him through eternity. Every head bowed.